Uh, but welcome to today's discovery session. These sessions are meant to support students, businesses, and other organizations with an understanding of how to use data and artificial intelligence. Before we get into it, I'd like just to begin by acknowledging that Deep Sense works out of Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And this territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship. My name is Lucia and I'm the communication specialist uh, and outreach coordinator for DeepSense. And for those of you who don't know what DeepSense is, I'll give you a quick little introduction. DeepSense is a project based out of Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, but we work with universities and colleges across Atlantic Canada. We work with companies in the ocean sector who are interested in harnessing the potential of data and creating a smarter ocean economy. And then we connect these companies with the next generation of AI machine learning and data experts, aka students, like some of you in our audience today. We work with these companies to create a project that best suits their needs. And then we find a researcher and student to help execute the project as either a co-op and internship can even be a master's project, really kind of depends what the student's needs are and what the company needs are. Uh, in the past, we've done projects in data analytics, data collection, data visualizations, data cleaning and processing, and of course, AI and machine learning. Projects could be anything from creating a deep learning model to track fish or creating a prediction model for safe navigation in a harbor or even a computer model that can identify whale shapes from aerial images. Um, so if you ever want to grow your skills and work on real projects and gain industry experience, make sure you submit your info to our student pool, which I'll drop the link in once we get started. And the projects and internships kind of pop up throughout the year. So it's useful just to throw your name in there. And that's the first place we're gonna check for um, students when we have positions come up. Uh, today's session will be an industry spotlight and we're going to dive into a company DeepSense is currently working with called OnDeck Fisheries AI. Uh, OnDeck develops software to automate fisheries monitoring with artificial intelligence, providing a cloud analytics platform for automated review of video footage from fish fishing vessels. And their solution is significantly cheaper, faster, and more scalable than existing monitoring strategies and can help revolutionize fisheries management and conservation all around the world. So today we have one of the co-founders of OnDeck, Alexander Dungate, ready to chat all about his journey to how he created OnDeck, what they do, what the future holds. Alexander brings together the worlds of fisheries and software innovation, was born and raised on the west coast of British Columbia and grew up living, fishing and playing in the beautiful Pacific Ocean. He holds a bachelor's in computer science and biology from University of British Columbia. And he has been awarded the title of Young Ocean Leader from the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and has won 10 plus awards for his impactful, impactful work with On Deck Fisheries AI. He will be interviewed by Deep Sense's own Sophie Treptow. She is our data readiness program manager at DeepSense. She connects students with companies in the ocean industry that are looking to solve a problem with AI or advanced data analytics. And she guides them through the process and helps the students and companies build out viable solutions together. She has experience in pharmaceutical consulting, marketing, strategy development, and graduated from Dalhousie University with a degree in finance. So we have some pretty awesome people who are gonna ch chat all about contact and AI. Um, remember, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat box or in the q and I'm going to keep an eye on those, but that's enough of me talking. I'm going to pass it off to Sophie and Alexander. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lucia, for the introduction. Um, taking questions at the end, I have a series of questions prepared for Alexander, just so you guys get a sense of what his journey has been like so far. Uh, any questions you do have, feel free to either pop in the chat or the Q&A section. We'll get to both of those at the end. Um, so I'll get started, I guess. What inspired you, Alexander, to start this whole journey that is on deck? Yeah, good question, Sophie. And uh, and thanks for the intro there, Lucia. The, the only thing I would add is is to the DeepSense intros. DeepSense is amazing to work with. Highly recommend it <laughs> to, to anybody, Thank you. anybody uh, listening out there. They're, they're terrific. Um, but what inspired me to start this journey um, would be uh, Biology 420 at the University of British Columbia and an amazing professor there. Uh, my whole life, I've always uh, absolutely loved everything to do with ocean conservation and, and kind of everything from playing in tide pools to, to fishing and swimming around in the ocean. Um, but I took this uh, um, amazing course. And in one of the lectures, uh, the professor introduced the problem space of fisheries monitoring and how it's 
a critical piece of the puzzle to be able to sustainably manage our fisheries. Uh, but right now it's so expensive and so slow because we have humans doing it manually. Uh, and because it's so expensive and so slow, we can't scale it up around the world. And this is a huge problem. Nobody knows what to do about it. Anyway, next slide. And then just kind of went on to talk about the rest uh, of the lecture. And then um, and a light bulb, that would be my, my light bulb moment, I think, uh, when it was kind of like, hold on, we can, we can definitely do something about that. Uh, and then I reached out to my professor to uh, see who they could connect me to to start learning more about the problem space. Uh, and that's a pro tip I would suggest to, to anybody with an idea. Uh, professors are very well connected and they love helping their students. Uh, so they were able to connect me to all sorts of people in the industry and it, and it snowballed from there. That's definitely some great advice is to use your professors as resources and the mm -hmm. university's resources when you're really trying to start out in the entrepreneurial world. So that's kind of how you came up with the idea, I guess, or at least the problem. Um, how did you then go about starting? How did you find your coworkers and what was the specific idea that you came to? Yeah. Uh, so actually I didn't want to start a business at first. I just wanted to solve this problem and, and learn more about the problem space. So I, uh, just started doing uh, customer interviews. I would email uh, everybody who would stand still <laughs> and, and, and talk to them. And um, it's right away, I, I would email like the, the at info email for these different companies or, or, or conservation groups. And consistently the, the C-suite, some of the, the leaders or presidents would, would email me back saying like, hey, this is a huge problem. What, what do you have to say about it? And at that point, I was uh, quite literally just a kid with an idea and, and nothing more. Um, and so that was very very empowering to see um, kind of leaders I, I look up to listening um, and, and kind of being on the same level, which was, which was a really neat experience. So I did about a, a hundred customer interviews just myself, just before anything started, just learning more about the problem space. And it became really, really clear that there's a real business need here. And the best way to make an impact in this space would be as a software startup, uh, focusing on, on scale and adoption. And that's exactly what the industry needed. Um, and so then to, to really get it going, then after, after my about six months and 100 interviews, uh, I reached out to the two smartest people I could find, uh, my co-founders, uh, who are also my, my best friends from, from grade six. Um, and we, we got on deck off the ground. Well, that's great to hear. That's so funny that you ended up working with people that you've known for your whole life. Um, so once you decided to get everything off the ground, how was it like starting up your own business? Uh, very hard. <laughs> uh, I you know, bet. My answer. Um, yeah. Uh, like uh, exhilarating and super fun and, and very hard. Um, but I think if you love what you're doing and you're passionate about it, uh, it's, and you like the people that you're working with, that's the other key. I think doing this with my best friends was um, like, especially for the, the first year was just such a blast. Uh, you get to, to travel around to, to places and oh, oh there you go. Oh, I, spot, I spotlighted. Nice. Sorry, I thought Sophie disappeared. Um, <laughs> Still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Um, yeah, and so my, my advice there would be uh, the people around you really matter. So find good co-founders and mm -hmm. accelerators really help too. Um, early on, we were accepted into the University of British Columbia's Startup Accelerator Program. Uh, I think most universities have something similar, um, and it's a terrific network of uh, a bunch of people going through the same same process. Anything you run into, someone else has already, or probably 10 people have already tackled that challenge and you can reach out right away. So uh, a big community around you really helps. Yeah, that's definitely good advice. Um, so what were some of the more granular process details? Like what did you actually have to do to start your own business? Uh, surprisingly easy to actually start the business on paper, uh, mm -hmm. like $350 and you can incorporate. <laughs> um, but the hard part is around um, kind of making sure you have, actually, I was, I had a great, great, great discussion with someone about this recently, another entrepreneur about this recently. The hard part is, is finding the truth of your problem and truly mm -hmm. knowing the truth of your problem. Um, Cause your uh, entrepreneurship is a lot of putting yourself out there um, and either, yeah, either being ready to be like totally shot down or having people like, absolutely love it and run with it and so it's really important for you to 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 know the truth of what you're doing so you can handle um any questions about it any criticisms about it um, take that constructively um and the way you find that truth is that the 150 
plus or now I think we're over that now we've stopped counting our customer interviews um, but uh, always be customer discovering is, is I think is, is the most important part and the hardest part is to make sure you're solving a problem that that really matters and then for us what helps turn that, that from kind of ideas and conversations into a business is we started doing uh, pitch competitions as our first kind of uh, steps into this world but even before we incorporated um, we just applied for, I don't know, I kind of thinking back, I don't know how we heard about some of these, but our, our mm-hmm. first big moment is, um, Washington university in St. Louis flew us down to do their pitch competition. Wow. Super fun. Um, and then we ended up winning a bunch of money and then that kind of started the product like, wow, hold on. There's, there's some meat to this. And pitch competitions are great because, um, you have a bunch of successful uh, past entrepreneurs or, or business people who really grill your idea and, and, help give you suggestions and what to do better next time. And then 10 bucks says in, in a month, there'll be another pitch competition you could enter and you can help refine it more. Uh, so that was, a, that was a great way of, of building it steadily. That sounds good. Yeah. The customer interviews sounded like they really help broaden the idea of what your problem is. And then the pitch competitions helped you drill down specifically on what you wanted to help solve, mm-hmm. uh, which sounds great. Um, so you said it was also challenging to start up your own business with your co-founders. How do you juggle everything? So acquiring funding, hiring, managing, um, product development, and then all of the data as well. How do you juggle everything? That's a very good question. And I think that's probably the, the most important question for everyone to, to answer for themselves. <laughs> I, I read a good quote recently about that saying it's as a leader, your job is to flip the most important bit. Um, the, a metaphor here being if in, in, in binary, if you're f- kind of flipping the three, if you have like a, a four digit number um, and you're flipping the last three bits as fast as you can, um, you'll still end up with a smaller impact than if you just flip the largest bit once. Mm-hmm. Um, and so being able to step back and kind of constantly reevaluate what's the best and most impactful use of my time right now um, and making sure you do that Kind of stepping back and reevaluating your priorities constantly is is the the best way I've I've found to do that and it, and that's quite hard and it takes some some time to to master that and then you get some tasks which are uh, annoying because they don't really help build the company but they're mission critical uh, so mm-hmm. sometimes it, it's uh, it's a balance but yeah I, I really like that analogy of, of your job as leaders to to flip the most important bits identify what's mission critical and start there. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Um, so now getting into a little bit more your company, what it does, and the AI piece of everything. Um, so your goal of your company is obviously to help the sustainability of fisheries, um, monitor how much fish are coming on board. Uh, can you just speak a little bit about your goal as a company? Yeah, for sure. So our goal is to help fisheries monitoring scale up uh, around the world. Now, because today they have uh, humans doing object tracking, which is wild, um, <laughs> but that's that's so expensive and slow that it can't be scaled up uh, to to most geographies around the world. In in North America, we can afford to do this um, as as a kind of very wealthy nation, um, but other countries where it's almost kind of debatably more important when you have a lot of kind of uh, subsistence fisheries communities, they can't necessarily afford these super expensive. Uh, monitoring technologies uh, to make sure people are fishing sustainably in their waters and that you don't have foreign fleets coming in and taking more than they're allowed to and leaving nothing for the local communities. Um, and so our, our mission is to empower these monitoring uh, agencies around the world, either private companies or governments, depending on where you are in the world, to be able to scale up um, their, their scope of monitoring to be able to ensure sustainable fishing on a global scale. Mm -hmm. So what are the main benefits then of using AI technology uh, to monitor fishing in the ocean? Mm -hmm. Uh, Reducing the, reducing time and costs, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, So for example, um, yeah, so actually, for example, uh, right now, if a boat is, is out at sea, you need some way of making sure they're following the rules. So there's uh, right now, the best way the industry does it is the cameras installed on the boat films 24 seven for the whole fishing trip. It's, uh, it's driving around fishing and it comes back to shore with hundreds of hours of video. Um, and so somebody manually sits down and watches hundreds of hours of video to manually count all the fish going one fish, two fish, three fish, blue fish, <laughs> <It's> wild. <laughs> and so 
Um, how AI helps here is by by automating that process. So that same human in the same amount of time, even before we get to complete automation, which is kind of the holy grail of, of the, the industry here, um, uh, baby steps like activity recognition and some other tools we've we've built can help that same person look through uh, twice as much, 10 times as much footage in the same amount of time. Okay, so for those in the audience who may not be as familiar with AI, how does your AI work? Mm, okay, from the perspective of those who aren't, um, basically we show, so we are, our AI processes video footage, yeah, video footage of fishing activity. So just think a, a video camera filming people fishing on a boat and it extracts uh, all the key moments from that video automatically. And the way we teach the computer to recognize this is basically by showing it 200,000 images of fish <laughs> and, then, and then teaching it to, to recognize different attributes um, about the scenes. Um, and specifically, the way we do this is by leveraging a lot of pre-existing knowledge from, from papers around the world and then fine tuning it to deal with a lot of challenges that are quite unique to the fishing industry. Um, for example, uh, a huge wave coming across the boat <laughs> um, and, and or splashing on the camera and, and raining in nighttime. And uh, fishers are amazing, super tough people and they fish 24 seven day or night. So how do you recognize uh, fish look different in, in different lighting conditions? Um, and so we kind of start with, um, yeah, kind of start based on this, this kind of a lot of academic knowledge built up in the space and, and fine tune it um, with some, some research to apply it to the fishing industry. Definitely. Uh, and you mentioned uh, leveraging academic knowledge that's kind of already been research. What have you found to be the difference between coding for research and developing a product for a business? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great. Uh, just as you said this, it reminded me of the everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. I <laughs> <laughs> yeah. would definitely disrupt the plan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'd think coding for research um, is most often in a controlled environment uh, mm -hmm. or more controlled than you'd see um, out in out in the open ocean. Um, uh, there's just so many more random random variables and there's some especially in, in, there's starting to be some papers that start to tackle this this space and, and more variable conditions for this area of computer vision um but the, and so i think yeah the two differences like to come to mind are, are the kind of more variability uh and the whole world of customers um and doesn't really matter if what you built is kind of top of the line like totally revolutionary is very cool no one's ever done this before but is it useful <laughs> does this is there any reason anybody would buy this from you what does it mm -hmm. help anybody else do their job better or accomplish something that they actually need to get done and is it something they can communicate the benefit of so i think there's um yeah there's a lot i could go into there but i think yeah i'll, I'll pause there for now no worries. If anybody has any further questions on that uh, afterwards, we'd be happy to dig into that more. Um, so obviously working with a team um, might be new in a business environment. How have you approached working together with other people, other interns, your co-founders to build out this model that will be customer facing, that'll be useful to the customers? Mm. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, the, the team building side is something uh, my co-founders and I are all quite passionate about because we've we all did a bunch of internships during our undergrad and some of our internships had wonderful company culture and we loved coming to work and we got so much more done there and we were so excited about it and we had other experiences that were terrible <laughs> um, and so it's really cool being able to design that from scratch um, and that's something that's um hard to balance with as you mentioned all the the other one of the questions you asked earlier was around how do you balance funding, development, research, like all, all, all these different things. And mm -hmm. one thing I would add to that is, is company culture. We think is super important. Um, uh, and so I think it happens a lot in the, the interviews, selecting the right people, making sure people will join for the right reasons. Um, and then also kind of making sure everybody, for, for my co-founders and I, and, and most of the people on the team, I think all of the people on the team, actually, we all work best when we feel like we're part of a high performance team. Mm -hmm. um, and so making sure we build that environment. 
Yeah, that's great. Um, some of the best I got advice I got about doing co-ops and internships during your university is you can find out what you really like, but you also more importantly, find out what you don't like at all, which is yep. super helpful when you're first entering the workforce. Um, so back to the AI model, how do you ensure the accuracy and reliability of your model for your customers? Mm. This is, this is a very big question in our field uh, because it's never been, what we're doing has never been like truly deployed at scale before. We're, we're changing how this industry works, which is really, really cool. Um, and one of the challenges is exactly what you asked there, Sophie, like, how do you, um, how do you prove that this is just as effective as a human sitting down and manually going one fish, two fish, three fish, blue fish. Um, and even further, how do you convince some of the most, um, uh, kind of risk averse people out there, like government regulators to accept this brand new shiny technology that's never been, um, used before in this, in this industry in this way. And so there are quantitative evaluation metrics um, that that uh, kind of that are often used for machine learning, like like accuracy and, and all this stuff. But uh, the the bigger one is around, um, and something we're excited to to start proving more of in the next year is comparing it to uh, human uh, performance mm. and using all of our uh, network in the fishery space to be able to compare this to humans and show the benefit that like, Hey, this, this would not be possible under the, yeah, to show our increased throughput, the, the, the accuracy and all that. And I think it's going to take uh, a long time for, uh, some governments to, to embrace this, but there's lots of baby steps along the way. Yeah. Definitely. There's a lot of hesitancy to adopt AI because there's a lot of unknowns that are about that. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, what are some of the main challenges your company faces with developing and implementing your technology? Would you say kind of resistance to this newer unknown technology is one of them? It's an interesting one. It's uh, not quite because it's, it's an interesting space where everybody and their dog is asking us to do this. Um, and that's something that's really, really cool. Everything from the fishers to the monitoring companies, to the governments, to, to NGOs, everybody is, is pushing in the same direction. Everybody has the same goal of, of scaling up monitoring around the world. And they all know AI is the key to do that. Um, the, the tricky part is everybody, everybody it's, it's kind of like to use a puzzle analogy, Everybody knows what the final picture is supposed to look like, but mm. nobody knows how to fit the pieces together yet. Nobody's done that yet. Um, and so I think one of the biggest challenges we face, there, the, the technical part is hard. Uh, for example, like general, uh, generalizability of, of some of our models is a challenge, although we're getting pretty good at that now. Um, and so the biggest challenge, the technical part is, is definitely possible. The challenge is the, the business puzzle of how to make sure everybody plays well together. And um, yeah, yeah. When you refer to everyone playing well together, what kind of uh, figures or organizations are you really working with? Yeah, so it, it depends on the uh, country. For example, in, in Canada, uh, fisheries monitoring is, is privatized. The DFO used to do it, but now there's private monitoring companies. So we, our clients in, in Canada are, are monitoring companies, but in other places around the world, um, it's the government does that. And so we interface both with, with private companies that are contracted out to do this as well as, as governments, uh, which have often have different, uh, motivations, like so on, on paper, perhaps the same motivations, but effectively quite different between a private business and, and, and government. Uh, there's also a lot of NGOs like the nature conservancy, the environmental defense fund, uh, are pushing really, really hard for this fisheries monitoring is such a socially impactful, environmentally impactful, uh, problem space that they're, uh, really doing everything they can to support on deck's mission, uh, to help make monitoring scalable around the world. Great. Um, so how can these organizations or individuals on a, on a more individual separate level support your efforts in creating more sustainable fishing practices? Hmm. That's a good question. For, for the individuals, I would say um, uh, learn up, read up <laughs> about, about uh, fisheries. They're super important. Um, maybe on this call, a lot of people will be tuning in from, from the Maritimes. And in that case, you're probably more familiar with fisheries than than most people in Canada. Something that that really surprised me is as we're out uh, p 
pitching or hiring or uh, anything, really often we have to start from ground zero of like, hey, did you know fish stocks are collapsing? Like fish are really important. 2.9 billion people around the world rely on fish as, as a source of protein. Um, and almost, yeah, most people in the world eat fish, but most people don't know that we're running out of fish um, and something actually has to change here. Um, so I think being aware of these, these problems are, are really important and, and asking yourself, hey, where does my fish come from is a good place to start. And then for those on the call that are technically inclined, um, I would say, first of all, apply to our open positions. We're hiring <laughs> um, on deck.fish slash careers and then or on LinkedIn. Um, and then uh, for the technical skills that we found are, are really in demand is, is learn how to deploy machine learning models. Um, because now most, most comp sci programs will, will teach you how to, or a YouTube video will teach you how to whip up a, a basic machine learning model and test it, and, and, and that's great. Um, but the really hard part is figuring out how to deploy that at scale. How do you put that on the cloud? Because uh, you can't process a thousand hour uh, video file on, on your laptop very easily. <laughs> um, and so experience deploying uh, machine learning models on, um, yeah, kind of at, at any scale beyond your local machine is really, really valuable um, and very hard to find. I know Sophie, you and I have have been in hunting for a long time for people who who know how to do this, and it's far and few between. So if anyone in listening figures that out, um, you'll be uh, you'll have no problem getting getting a job. Yeah. With on deck or anyone else. Exactly. Yeah, with on deck or anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely one of the more important skills to learn. Um, I was going to ask what sort of skills students should focus on. Uh, developing to be the most hireable and marketable versions of themselves when they're working. And so deployment, would you say, is one of the biggest ones? Yeah, 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 uh, definitely deployment. And then cloud infrastructure is great as well. Um, any opportunity you can to go beyond the scope of your classes and really uh, show that you can, yeah, show that you can build and deploy something when it's not just for a class assignment. Something that really helps people stand out um, in, in our hiring pipeline is uh, if you've been on, on student teams or personal projects, um, ideally when you've built something as a team and when you're able to describe um, your, role, your role in that well, that, that, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Both important points. And that highlights the difference, I think, between um, doing academic sort of research and when you're actually in the business world, the deployment part is just as important, if not more important, to be able to get your product out there. Um, so in the category of advice, what advice would you give to other entrepreneurs who want to address either environmental challenges or just a uh, new AI technology? Hmm. Uh, for for new entrepreneurs that are are, if you yeah if you have an idea, and you're uh, thinking about it, I would say try it. Definitely go for it. Um, ask people. Put your idea out there. It's uh, I find it very very scary at first. Now now it's it's kind of I've grown a thicker skin and it's fine. But at at first you really have to just jump and really put yourself out there. Um, and so I would say 100% go for it. Ask ask your professors, ask email anyone in the, in the space. Something I've learned uh, over the past two years with this is uh, people love helping. Uh, I think especially young entrepreneurs, honestly, I think we have a bit of an unfair advantage there. Um, we have faced other challenges, but uh, yeah, mentors, uh, there's there's no shortage of, of a mentorship available in the space. People will help you make this idea possible. People will challenge your idea and, and that's good and healthy for, for your idea. But I would just say, yeah, try it, go out, talk to people, do it. Yeah. That's some great advice. Thank you, Alexander. All right. I have one more question before we can get into some audience questions. And that is, what is your vision for the future of this company and its impact on the fishing industry? Hmm. Yeah, that's 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 a that's a good one. So our our vision is to truly enable the monitoring industry to scale up fisheries monitoring around the world. Um, being being the the player that kind of truly enables sustainable like and it makes it possible to ensure sustainable fishing around the world um, would be or it, frankly it is already very very cool. We're already moving the needle in this space. 
Um, and that's a very cool feeling, especially as a young entrepreneur, um, changing, seeing that we're, we're changing conversations and changing how uh, companies are, are strategizing their, their future on how they can scale up their business is, is very, very cool. Um, because a, a world where there's accessible and affordable fisheries monitoring around the world um, would be incredible. It would help protect 800 million people who, around the world who rely on fisheries for, for their jobs um, and, and to feed their families. Um, and so starting in this space uh, with On Deck is extremely impactful and there's a great market opportunity here. And then uh, beyond that, kind of pivoting into similar problems in adjacent industries um, deploying, there's, there's lots of people that are still doing object tracking manually and need help kind of really figuring out how to incorporate AI into their um, business. So there's kind of lots of inbound requests here for, for helping to enable adjacent industries to, uh, yeah, leverage, leverage AI in their, their business model. Are there any industries specifically that you'd be interested in getting into once you've kind of mastered the fishing industry? Yeah, mastered. We have solved overfishing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so after we solve overfishing, um, there's actually the there's similar applications in in, in fish processing that we've uh, heard a lot about, and also in in mining and and uh, so some others that are that are in the works. But we're 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 staying laser focused on on fisheries monitoring for now, for sure. Uh, that is that's another. Uh, bit of, uh, yeah, uh, unsolicited advice I would, I would pass along to anybody interested is, is as you put your idea out there, everyone will say like, oh, this is great, but like, you should also do it for, for this and that and that. And it's very important to kind of circling back to the truth of what you're, what you're building um, is, is staying focused. So yeah, we're, we're going to solve overfishing first and then, and then we'll loop back to you, Sophie. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm looking forward to you solving the world's issue of overfishing yeah. for everyone. Um, all right. I'm seeing so far a question in the Q&A section, uh, which is, I don't know if I have to answer this live. How and where did you find your first pot of gold? How are you finding the financial support you needed to keep the company going? And then there's another question. I'll give you time to answer that first. Yeah, great question. Um I think Canada is the best place in the world to start an ocean startup. Um, genuinely, everyone talks about Silicon Valley, like, ooh, you can, um, oh, I know, yeah. So I think in Silicon Valley, it's easier to raise like $2 million off of, off of a PowerPoint deck and nothing else. Um, not, not these days though. And I think the benefit Canada has is we have a very strong ocean economy and there's a lot of resources being put into um, Kind of building up our, our ocean economy and, and modernizing it and, and ensuring it, it stays powerful to come. So uh, for us specifically, we started with pitch competitions um, as, as, as kind of baby steps. Uh, and there's a lot of grants available in the space. Uh, on deck ticks a lot of boxes for kind of youth led team, uh, AI, everybody loves AI these days. <laughs> Uh, uh, saving the ocean, marine conservation, um, and so putting those together, you kind of you're uh, we're, we're eligible for a lot of uh, public grants from the government of Canada, um, as as well as as private granting organizations, uh, especially if there's any students uh, listening as well. I think some of the first uh, kind of pots of gold available. There's a lot of pitch competitions, not only at your university but just ar around the world, um, that are only open to students. So I'd definitely check those out. And then once you kind of grow out of these first pitch competitions, you can start to be eligible for bigger and bigger grants. Um, so for example, the, the first pitch competition we ever won was like, woohoo, we got $5,000, uh, which felt like a ton of money back then. And then uh, um, you start to be eligible for, for example, and then and then the next grant will give you maybe 10K. And then if they see that you're like, oh, okay, they leveraged that pretty well, then, then maybe like the next grant will double that. Um, and that kind of exponential snowball effect on, on the support people will provide you uh, is, is, yeah, it adds up. So the pots of gold are getting bigger and bigger as you leverage your money wisely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. And then the second part of that question was where do you see on deck in one to two years? Mm. Uh, that's a good question with hmm trying to think of, of, of specifics here or, or short answer to that. In, in, in one to two years, what we're excited to see is 
this technology um, truly enabling like like massive changes in 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 scalability and accessibility for fisheries monitoring, um, and and I think in in one year it will still be kind of the the first um, first few customers like really really getting the hand, handle of on this, um, and then in two years we should start to see kind of uh, very real adoption of this uh, as we're able to I think as as some clients are able to see their competitors using our technology and like hold on they're they're able to process. Uh, twice as much footage for a tenth of the cost. Um, that's yeah. The, so we're excited to see kind of real scalable uh, customer attraction in the next year or two. Great. And then obviously, world or year three ending world overfishing. Yes. Yeah. Solving solving uh, collapsing fish stocks. Great. Um, okay. So our next question is from Ayush, and he says, Alexander, what is something you wish you would have known before becoming a CEO? Oh, that's a great question, Ayush. Um, I hmm. I'm actually that's that's uh that's really interesting. I feel like I'm actually surprised I don't have uh, a big answer uh, brewing in my mind. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the advice I've I've shared already. Um, I guess how much fun this would be. Um, I didn't know that uh, when I was when I was starting really just wanted to solve solve a problem but if you're working on something you love and and building new technology is really cool and and, and saving the world sweet too so uh, doing that with people you like to work with is is a blast um and the number of opportunities it uh, opens up is 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 wild i did not expect that um so yeah that's another reason i would encourage again i would encourage others and, and my young self to like do it go for it jump i almost did a I was in a master's of management degree um, and mm -hmm. I dropped, dropped out of that or deferred indefinitely um, to start on deck. And actually I asked uh, one of my professors in the master's degree, Hey, I'm thinking of starting a startup or finishing this master's degree. What should I do? And the professor in the master's degree said like, Oh, don't do the master's degree. Definitely start a startup. You'll learn way more, <laughs> more uh, <laughs> running a startup. And that's definitely true. Absolutely. There's only so much school can teach you. Um, what sort of opportunities were you referring to when you said you had no idea what kind of opportunities this would bring, just in terms of people you would work with, um, the kind of grants you're getting for this work particular? Um, could you dive a little deeper into that? Yeah. Um, if I think if you find a problem, if you find a, a real problem that people are, are a, a visceral problem or a, a bleeding neck problem as, as a lot of people in the startup space put it, um, or, or, or a hair on fire problem. If, if someone's hair is on fire, they will do everything they can to put it out. Like if you hand them a brick, like great, they'll try to put out the fire with a brick. Um, and, and so if you, if you find something like that, uh, people will support you and, and try to, to help you solve the problem. So for us specifically, it's everything from the government of Norway saying, hey, please uh, come to this fisheries conference in, in Bergen. And I never thought I would get to, to visit Norway. That was super cool. And, or similar like uh, around the, the States got to come out to Halifax, which was really cool. Got, um, uh, got to see some sweet deep sense swag out there. The, the mysterious deep sense socks we were talking about earlier. So the, um, yeah, so I think traveling around the world, um, the people you get to talk to, um, the, I, I highly recommend joining, um, part of accelerators and mentorship programs and as, as many as you can. And the, conversations are able to have and the people the people you're able to talk to are not people that you can access uh if you're not running your own company so um, yeah. definitely and for those students who haven't already started their own business obviously there's a little way to go before that um we do have a mentorship program as well uh that when lucia is doing the wrap up we will happily share the details of um, all right, it looks like we have two more questions. Uh, Mackenzie wants to know, how do you ensure the accessibility of the AI? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. Um, and that's something that's top of mind for us right now, because uh, often our clients are quite competitive with each other. And what we're really trying to encourage, like our, our, it's critical for us to work with everybody. Because if we start only working with one firm or two firms, um, that doesn't help make monitoring accessible around the world. That makes one person's company much um, more profitable. And so our, the steps we're taking right now are 
figuring out how to make, uh, actually, that's a, this is a really good question. So th this loops back to the, the biggest problem we're trying to solve in about making monitoring scalable is the business challenge. And so what we're, what we're doing is when we get, we're getting a lot of inbound requests, say from, from, uh, uh, shark and Ray sustainability lab in South Africa that doesn't have a huge budget, <clears throat> but they're doing some really important work. They need to count the, the fish coming onto the boat, or in that case, the sharks coming onto their boat. Uh, and so what we're doing is figuring out business models that make sense for both a small uh, underfunded shark and Ray sustainability lab and the government of Australia with a uh, uh, kind of seemingly unlimited budget. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the, those are the steps we're taking for now. Wow, very interesting. Uh, definitely a great question. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, all right, we have one more question from Alyssa uh, asking about cybersecurity. She asks, what cybersecurity policies and measures are you looking to apply to your applications or have you already applied? Yes, this is uh, top, of, top of mind for us. This is something we're, we're establishing more of in the spring. Um, cybersecurity in the international AI uh, ecosystem is tricky because oh, yeah, Sophie disappeared for a moment, but um, each, each country, especially when we're dealing with different governments, they have different data management policies. Uh, and for us specifically, we're dealing with fishing footage or, or, or video footage of people on their boats and their boats are their homes at sea. It's like, it's like having a security camera in, in your house. Um, and so that's, that's very sensitive data. And so there's a lot of, I'm sorry, I can't answer your question, Alyssa, specifically, because it depends uh, wildly on the country um, and the, the the geography we're dealing with. But I'd love to talk to you more about that afterwards, because it is something where we're uh, digging into more and more. That's also something the government of Canada is, is helping us with, uh, which is great. That is great to hear. Um, and yeah, it's definitely a hot topic, the protection of data and privacy and all that sort of stuff, especially within the realm of AI when people are new perhaps to the concept of AI and are really unsure of its uh, abilities. So definitely um, an important topic to discuss further. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to pop them in either the chat or the Q&A. Um, if there are no further questions, I'm happy to pass it off to Lucia um, to wrap things up and provide everyone with resources that they can either reach out to Alexander through or us or the mentorship program. Um, but she will talk a little bit more about those. Um, I'm not seeing any further questions in the Q&A or chat. So I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us, Alex, and I'll hand it over to Lucia. Yeah, and and I'll just say a quick thank you, Sophie. Thanks, Lucia. Uh, I will I will put in one more good word for Deep Sense. They're amazing. Uh, highly recommend working with them as as either a student or a company. Uh, check them out. Uh, they've been they've been wonderful for us. So thank you so thank much, Alex. For tuning in. Yeah. Same for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You guys did great. Um, as Sophie mentioned, we do have a mentorship program uh, run through Deep Sense, Shifty, and Surge Innovation and it's called STEM Connector. I'll drop a bunch of links in the chat right now, um, but it's a great way to join and it's flash mentorship. So it's, you can reach out to anyone on the platform and ask them for a one-on-one -on -one -on -one meeting about like kind of wanting to learn more about their career or wanting, I talked with someone who was uh, presenting, was nervous of presenting, so it's giving her tips on presentations. So it's more, it's different from like your usual formal mentorship where you meet with someone once a month uh, for however, for like a year. This is, like I said, it's a flash mentorship. So feel free to sign up through uh, that link I sent. I'll take you to uh, the Deep Sense page and then you can click the link and you can go into Mentor City, make a profile. Just make sure to fill out your profile so that when uh, you reach out to your mentor, they know who you are and make sure you uh, tell them why you're reaching out to them and why you'd like to meet. Uh, and as well as I dropped some links to our discovery session playlist. So we try to do a discovery session uh, every month and the topics range from cybersecurity with Alyssa to building your resume to writing emails. So definitely explore our uh, YouTube playlist there because there's a lot of awesome discovery sessions from the past and we'll be adding this one to that uh, in the coming week. And I added the link for the student pool if you're interested in joining DeepSense, but I feel like a lot of the people in the audience are already, or 
were Deep Sense students or are Deep Sense students currently. Um, Alexander dropped some links there for, about on deck. Uh, and if you're interested in learning or connecting with him or someone else at on deck, let feel free to email us at info at deepsense.ca. We can definitely connect you um, if you have any more specific questions. And I think that covers everything on my end, but thank you so much, Alexander, for coming this morning, uh, BC time. And thank you, Sophie, for hosting this wonderful interview. I think we covered a lot of cool topics and I hope we inspired some people uh, who are maybe thinking of starting their companies or kind of gave some good tips. And I learned a lot, I took notes throughout, which is great. And I love to hear that Canada is a great place to do an ocean startup, especially as working in an organization where we want to be able to help as many ocean companies as possible. So that's great to hear that there's a lot of infrastructure and support for companies as well. But yeah, so thank you everyone. Once again, I'll, re I'll send the recording to everyone. If, uh, so you will have it, it'll be on YouTube and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, Lucia. No problem, bye. bye.